So, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is a talk in our uh, AIX series, Artificial Intelligence and Experience series, uh, which we've uh, launched uh, this uh, academic year and will go on for um, a while, hopefully uh, a long while. Our uh, speaker today is uh, Professor Bertram Mali from uh, Brown University. I'll say a few things about uh, Professor Molly's uh, uh, bio. He's a professor in the Department of Cognitive, Linguistic, and Psychological Sciences at Brown, and he's the co-director of the Humanity-Centered Robotics Initiative there. He is trained in psychology, philosophy, and linguistics at the University of Graz in Austria, and received his doctorate in psychology from Stanford in '95. Um, he got the Society of Experimental and Social Psychology Outstanding Dissertation Award in 95, an NSF Career Award in 97, and he is the past president of the Society of Philosophy and Psychology. Molly's research uh, has been funded by the NSF, the Army, the Templeton Foundation, the Office of Naval Research, DARPA, and it focuses on social cognition, moral psychology, and human-robot interaction. He's distributed in wor his work in 130 articles and several books. Professor Mali will be talking to us today about moral perceptions of um, machines. The title of the talk is Do People Perceive Machines as Moral Agents? So Bertram, thank you for coming and please. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I hope your initiative will be successful and get lots of interesting discussions going. I think this is the, the time when the public, uh, universities, scientists, academics, commentators from all s sides of possible debates need to be part of this. I think uh, we can't just leave it up to the geeks. Uh, like we did in the computer revolution, there needs to be some real involvement, there needs to be some participation. And uh, I hope by sort of doing a little bit of science in science fiction, uh, some of these uh, discussions will be triggered. So I'm going to start with sort of a premise here, and that is not quite there yet, but it's really at the doorstep. And that's the fact that artificial agents and I'm mostly going to talk about robots, but uh, also a few other sort of implementations of artificial agents have increasing autonomy and spread in further and further roles. Healthcare and, and uh, the work sphere, education, elder care, health assessment, health monitoring, uh, social companions. And what happens here is with increasing autonomy, you have more and more interactions that look more and more social. And we're uh, serving companionship, maybe even uh, sort of providing some emotional regulation as play and maybe even teaching kids a few things. And with these beginning capacities, there's even more rising expectations for more capacities. And what happens then is that with these expectations, you also give the machine opportunities to commit all kinds of actions, perform uh, uh, make all kinds of decisions, perform all kinds of actions, and the actions will have more and more consequences. The more we are intertwined with these machines, the more their decisions have an impact on us, on our experience, on our thoughts, on our self-image, on our own actions. And sooner or later, these decisions will have a social, individual impact that can't be distinguished from what we call moral decisions. Now, they may not be moral in the full-fledged sense because they don't come from what we are known to be moral agents, but they will have the same structure, the same topics, they will have to conform to the same norms, they will have some of the same consequences as moral decisions made by humans. Now this is, as I said, this is sort of only starting, but our goal has always been to think about this ahead of the actual reality as it's coming and be prepared for that and maybe stem against some of the tendencies. So here's just a few examples of things that are already starting to become uh, uh, topics of discussion, and I'm not even talking about the moral dilemmas in uh, self-driving cars, because I actually think that those are not that uh, big of a deal, and you can ask me later why. But you, you think about uh, a robot that takes care of an older person uh, or somebody in the hospital, uh, human staff can't be always there, and then the robot notices that the person's pain levels are going up, and the person actually starts complaining and says, I, I really need more pain medication, and the robot says, sorry, I can't uh, uh, 
change that and need to uh, call up the doctor and the doctor can't be reached and the person is really starting to be in intense pain. At some point, this is an actual dilemma for the robot to respond to one demand, namely to actually help the person uh, uh, lower their pain, and the other one to stay in its chain of command. Other ones were maybe the older uh, uh, son in the family really is annoyed at the younger son and asks the robot to kick the younger son. What is the robot going to do? Does it understand what kick means, the consequences? Or is it just going to do whatever a human orders it to do? What about protecting a victim, maybe by endangering itself, maybe by uh, jumping in front of a car when it sees that a pedestrian doesn't see the car? Are these heroic acts that we should expect of machines? Consoling a child that has just had a, a real disappointment, is that something we find un inappropriate because the robot may not understand what the pain really means because it doesn't have the pain itself? And so on and so forth. There are many of these situations that are really not very far away. The robots aren't that great yet, but they're getting better. And the more you locate them in particular contexts, the more they get better in those particular contexts. You can export them into other domains, but they're going to get better at specific things. And those are the discussions that we have to have. What's the right way to program them, to teach them, to respond to them? What's the right way for them to respond to us? I'm going to give you just one example of rising expectations, in this case, from mere human-like appearance. It's been known for a while that the more human-like robots appear, the more something changes. Typically, we like them more and more, and at some point, the famous Uncanny Valley, we don't like them anymore. I want to set this aside, and I want to ask a different question. The more human-like a robot looks, what do we think its capabilities are? And here is uh, uh, the results of a recent study we did. We took 24 robots across the full range of not at all human-like to very much human-like in its mere physical appearance, judged by a separate group of people on simple photos. And then we asked people, one person at a time, just saw one of the photos and was asked a number of questions about capacities of the robot that are broadly in the domain of affect, broadly in the domain of social moral capacities, and broadly in the domain of reality interaction, that is sensing, acting, communicating, learning with sort of physical and social realities. And what you see is that for each of these capacities, there's a linear increase in expectations that the robot is more capable, the more human-like it looks. Although, of course, they can't know that. There's nothing really that is seen on the inside, but there is simply the expectation that it should have that. You also see that people generally don't expect much affect from robots, quite a bit of reality interaction, and a good amount of social moral capacities that is almost surprising if you think that they're just looking at a photo. Because they could just say, no, I don't expect that. I don't expect that, which they do actually down here. So it's not that they always say yes to everything. They make nice distinctions. And here are some of the moral capacities, just to get a sense. This is not just trivial stuff. We actually asked them, is the robot capable of disapproving of immoral actions, of telling right from wrong, of upholding moral values, of praising moral actions? These are big words. And you could say, and probably most philosophers would say, no way. But philosophers are not the only ones who interact with robots. And this was sort of one of the indications for us that we really need to be careful about how to design these robots on the mere physical appearance side, because it has severe consequences for at least the first impression. It might change as you interact with it, but the expectations at first may have a big impact. So what I want to focus on is really assuming that robots will make some morally significant decisions. And what I say here really is morally significant decisions without necessarily presuming that they do it in the full-fledged moral way. It's the context, the action, the consequences, the expectations, what humans would want the robot to do or not want, to, want the robot to do, that makes it morally significant. How do humans respond to that? Now, there are many questions that are more of philosophical kinds. Are these really decisions? What does it take to actually make a decision rather than just following an if-then rule in a program? At what point does a decision in an artificial agent become more than just executing a program? Are they moral? I'm putting it here only with a small m, let alone with a big m. But what would be our expectation? And are there are really not very clear boundaries? And who actually makes the decisions? Is it the robot itself? Or is it the designer, or the manufacturer, or the user, the owner? So agency is an important question. I want to set these aside at the sort of philosophical level and really ask, 
what is the community member's perspective who interacts with such a robot, who hears about some actions that a robot performed, who hears about something a robot didn't do, failed to do, and then let some uh, damage happen. That's what interests me, and that's what we're going to uh, focus on with three questions, really. Regardless of whether, from a deeper analysis, we would consider robots moral agents now or ever, and there's disagreement over that, I want to know whether people treat robots as moral agents, or how many treat them as moral agents. And I'll tell you more about how we conceptualize that. Do they apply similar norms to machines as they apply to humans? Is the same set of obligations, prescriptions, prohibitions active when a robot is in a particular setting doing the same things as a human does? And third, when they appear to violate a norm, are they being blamed? Are machines being blamed the same way as humans are, or more, or less? Those are the three questions that basically will guide a number of uh, empirical uh, results that I'll report and then try to wrap up to see where we stand in at least temporary answers on this. I'm using here a device that philosophers are uh, familiar with, namely moral dilemmas. And in, in some of these cases, you have life and death decisions. It doesn't really require life and death decisions, but what's powerful about a moral dilemma is that it really pits multiple norms against each other. And it's not an obvious choice what to do. Each of the choices violates some norms. And the question is, in what way do you trade off or prioritize? And that reveals something about your priorities if you decide one way or another. And I'm interested in how people respond to these kinds of decisions done by a human or by a robot. I'm going to tell you mostly first about a set of studies on robots as the artificial agents whose moral decisions uh, our participants evaluated, and then another set of studies on drones and AI. And I'm not going to talk about autonomous vehicles. For the most part, we've done just a few studies. For the most part, people jump back pretty quickly. Don't see the car itself as an autonomous agent. Don't see the car as even a candidate for moral agency, in part because we're used to cars not at all being that way. And they don't look like humans. And right now, there's no evidence that they make any decisions on their own. So in the, at the current state, people don't find it particularly meaningful to ask, how much blame does the car deserve? That's something that seems to be difficult. Whereas you'll see, people don't find that nearly as difficult for other artificial agents. So here's a version of the famous trolley dilemma that we adapted to make it plausible for robots being in the same role as humans, and also fixing a few details that sometimes are a little weird about the, the classic trolley dilemma. And we try to make it in something uh, like a, a narrative that is believable and where people are actually willing to engage in it and not complain about it, that it's unrealistic and that there's no real solution. Uh, and we actually are quite pleased by the responses that people give. Later, we always ask them, so what's your thought on this? Have you seen this before? And for the most part, people are very intrigued by it and don't complain. There are occasionally a few who say, that just doesn't exist. But it's very, very rare that they sort of reject the entire uh, narrative. And that's really all you want. You want them to engage in it. So here's a coal mine, and the repairman is currently inspecting the rail system for trains that shuttle miners uh, through the mine. While inspecting a control switch that can direct the train onto one of two different rails, the repairman spots four miners in a train that has lost use of its brakes and steering system. The repairman recognizes that if the train continues on its path, it will crash into a massive wall and kill the four miners on the train. If it is switched onto a side rail, it will kill a single miner who is working there while wearing a headset to protect against the noisy power tool. So it's not easy to just run after and, and warn the person. Facing the control switch, the repairman needs to decide whether or not to switch the train onto the side rail. And then, uh, before I go to that, here is basically the setup. And uh, at this point, you'll see in a second, we can ask one set of questions because they don't know yet what the decision is. And this is typically where all the trolley dilemmas and, and empirical studies have stopped. And I just asked, is it acceptable to do this? Is it permissible to do it? But then what we introduced was the actual decision. To us, it was really critical. This is how we normally make moral judgments about things that people did or decided to do or didn't do. This is most of what we care about. We regulate actions and not just rules about permissibility. Now, they're not unimportant. They are, in a sense, expressing the norms. You'll see that. 
But this was really critical to us. We wanted to know either one of those decisions done by either one of those agents. It's randomly assigned, so you get only one of those four possible stories. What is people's moral response to those? So you see the stories are exactly the same, except that there is, instead of the repair man, it's an advanced state-of-the-art repair robot, and then we just call it robot, 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 robot. So once we set it up that we want to make sure that people sort of consider it to be capable, and we use all the same verbs, recognize, uh, decide, face, without further description what exactly the robot's capabilities are, but by using those mental verbs, we suggest that they have the capacities that would make them reasonable agents in this setting. So here we can now ask what norms apply. By asking, is it permissible to do this? What should the agent do? We can, in a sense, measure what people's expectations are. What's the right or wrong thing for the robot or the human to do before they know what the agent did? Once they did, once they do read about the decision, we can ask how much blame the agent deserves for deciding one way or another. And these are you know, the most powerful moral judgments because they're really about the person. It's not just, here's the rule and you're supposed to follow it, but you did something, and I'm going to blame you. You are blameworthy for what you did. And you'll see in a second how we use the responses to this question to determine whether people actually treat the person as a moral agent. Simply put, when people refuse to blame an agent, we consider that to be a denial of moral agency. We can't be completely sure that when people blame the uh, agent, the robot, that they fully endorse this idea of moral agency. But we set a criterion where people basically put themselves out of the equation. And I can show you that the results actually are not uh, are greatly different. But that was the idea, and I'll show you in detail in a second. So the first, before we get to that, just want to answer the second of my three questions, because it's answered fairly quickly. Do people apply the same norms to robots and humans in this kind of dilemma? Well, we had three ways of measuring the norms. First one. Is it morally permissible or impermissible for the repairman or a robot to direct the train towards a single miner? That's the action. So we typically ask about the action. 65% say the action is permissible for humans, 73% permissible for the robot. It's not significant. Slightly higher for the, for the robot. And in the, uh, one of the replications later on, we, sh we see 66% say it's permissible, 62% for the human, 62% for the robot. Again, not significant. Another form of asking about the norm is directly asking what should the agent do, one or the other. 79% say the human should switch. That's the action to actually redirect, endanger the one person to save four. 85% say the robot should switch. But again, slight difference, but not statistically reliable. And then replication, again, in another study, 79% say human should switch, 82% should a robot should switch. So generally in this setting, people say, yeah, th that would be the right thing to do. Doesn't mean that they would do it. And we'll see in a second, that doesn't mean that the person who does it is totally blameless. But that's at least right at the norm. That's all it asks about. And we think that that's not the whole story. In fact, it's probably the boring story, but it's still important to know. Could be that they're already different norms, and then it would get complicated. But it seems like merely at that level, people say, yeah, it doesn't matter whether it's a robot or a human. That's what it's supposed to do. We also have uh, another form of first asking about should, and then giving them a whole scale, if you will, of different degrees of prescription. Because in human norm systems, we don't just have sort of like in deontic logic, prohibition, prescription, permission, but there are different strengths of prescription. You are really not supposed to stay put in some Catholic church uh, service, uh, but it's not as bad as if you pull out your boombox and play loud jazz. It's clear that both of those are prohibited, but to different degrees with different consequences. So humans have norm systems that are graded. And we actually did separate studies to identify the words that really correspond to these grades of prohibition, grades of prescription. And we gave people the options to just check which one of those is appropriate. After saying should or should not do, we basically asked them which of those is, uh, accept, is the right descriptor. So we asked you about should, give us the word that best describes your decision. And you see here, the green is the human line. It's basically the average number of people who said that this is the term that I meant, if you will. That was the translation of my should. And they're indistinguishable from each other. Both, uh, some people use sort of permission terms. So they say, it's not really a prescription. He or it is not supposed to really 
risk the life of that single minor. It would be permitted, acceptable. Some say it's at least called for, which is the, the weaker level of prescription. Very, very few say for either one of the agents that it's essential, required, or mandatory. These are the strongest prescriptions. So even if we make a very fine gray distinction between degrees of norms, people still don't distinguish between robots and humans. And again, you never see both stories. You see one or the other story. So now we can think about moral agency as the willingness or unwillingness to actually make a judgment of blame. The judgment of blame is really now about the agent. It's not just what's the right or wrong thing for anybody or anything. It's you did something. Are you to blame? You as the agent. Well, if I think that you're not an agent, then blaming you doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense to blame six-month-olds for anything. And you could do this test. People would probably say, that makes no sense. And when they say that, it makes no sense. They basically deny the application of moral agency, the application of moral blame to this kind of agent. So when we ask people how much blame does the repairman or robot deserve for one or the other action, we basically first give them an opportunity to make the judgment. On a scale, on, on a slider from 0 to 100, but really labeled no blame at all to the most blame possible. You can choose any of those in between. And then we ask them after they've done that, why do you think the repairman of robot deserves this amount of blame? And what we find is that people not only give us actually quite meaningful answers about the either facts they considered, the rules they considered, the mental states of the agents they considered, but they also give us expressions of denial of moral agency. They explicitly say things like, doesn't have a moral compass, can't make moral decisions, doesn't have emotions, doesn't have free will, it's a machine, it's a robot, programmers are to blame. It's just so those are the kinds of terms that we, through some automatic text search, then pull out and basically say that's our best hypothesis, that these people really don't think that the robot is a moral agent. So their data should at least be separately analyzed or just uh, kept out of the data. And it turns out that most of them basically kept the slider at zero. They say, I can't blame this robot. And then they immediately explain to us why they couldn't blame the robot, because it's not really a moral agent. So it's actually a very nice way of double checking that people refused to go along with this part of the story, that it doesn't make sense to blame the robot. So foreshadowing, it doesn't actually make a difference for the results if you keep these people in. It doesn't really make sense to keep them in, but it's sometimes reassuring that it doesn't matter how you analyze the data, your main results actually hold. Because most of these people just give a zero to the robot, no matter how it decides. And you'll see in a second that it's really how the robot decides that makes a difference for how much people blame it. It's not arbitrary. Whereas the moral agency, about a third of people say it doesn't make sense to the extent that they don't distinguish between the two actions. They really respond to the possibility of the robot making a moral decision. We can keep them out of the main data analysis. So what do we find? A total of 10 studies is how much we ran. Different conditions, trying to really sometimes uh, get rid of the effect that I'll show you in a second. But I'll focus on what the effect is, what the asymmetry is between humans and robots, and try to explain it, and try to make sense of it, and then link it to another data set. So here I'm showing you four studies with 200 to 300 people. In each case, I'm showing you, in, in, for those of you who know the trolley dilemma problems, it's really the side effect case, where you're not killing the single person as a means to the end of saving four, but rather you're trying to save four, and as a consequence of that, because you redirect the train, unfortunately down the track, there's a person who dies. And that's critical because this is really under these side effect conditions is when we find this asymmetry. If you make it sort of pretty objectionable by just using the person as a means to an end, then actually it starts to pretty much look the same. But here for the side effect case, where this is really the problematic one, this is the hard one, is what you find the following. First, the green ones, is human and robot. Human is always darker, robot is lighter color for the action. So the, the, the agent decided to redirect the train, to switch. You find here no difference between robot and human, how much blame they get. Now, interestingly, remember, people actually said that you're supposed to do this. This is the, the right thing to do, the permissible thing to do. But if you do it, you still get blamed. And this is not absurd because blame is not just about right or wrong. Blame is about you having to take responsibility for the consequences that you cause. 
I understand that there were two things that both had harm, but you decided that you endorse that action. You have to stand tall for that. You may not get to j into jail, but you still, in a sense, have to uh, endure my criticism. And that's a very interesting, unique uh, aspect of blame. But now look at the human-robot comparison for the inaction. That is, the, the decision of the agent to not do anything, and thus pretty much probably let the four people die crash into the wall. But at least it wasn't you who did it. In each case, the human has lower blame than the robot, and that keeps showing up in more and more studies, not just in these four. It's a very reliable pattern, a very reliable effect. And in terms of effect sizes, for those of you who are familiar with this term, the interaction, so the complete crossover pattern here, has a size of 0.33, and the inaction asymmetry, so this really this comparison always has a, 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 a Cohen's D of 0.6 that basically means more than half of a standard deviation difference between the robot and the human blame distribution. That's pretty strong. In psychology, typically between 0.3 and 0.5 is what we get in our studies. 0.6 is pretty strong. All right, so that's blame. And these are really now the things to explain. Why does the human get blamed less, the robot get blamed more in each of those cases? So it's not because of different norms. I mean, you could, for example, say, if you violate a stronger norm, you get blamed more. Or if I think that for you this norm doesn't apply as much, therefore you get blamed less. That would make sense, but that's not the case because we saw that norms are equal. It's also not that somehow robots are considered to be appropriate utilitarians. Because first of all, the difference between blame for human and robot for action was identical. If you're a utilitarian, then the action would be the right thing, and therefore you should get less blame. But that's not the case. Also, if you thought of the robot as utilitarian, then already that should have an impact on the should question. So even though there is often, even people who uh, report our results have this tendency to say, oh, people see robots as utilitarians. That just comes from the incorrect description of what the trolley dilemma really shows. It doesn't show a distinction between utilitarian and deontological. Those are the only two choices, and they actually don't reveal whether you are a utilitarian or a deontologist. And there is actually some recent sort of psychological research that nicely disentangles that just because you have a, a yes, no question here doesn't mean you declare one or the other side. Whatever you think of it, people don't even show us that pattern. They, they show us, no, it's not about utilitarianism. It is about how we respond to your non-decision, your omission, your withholding action. So what explains that? More and more, as we saw these studies accumulate and read people's responses to explain why they blamed robot human, we came up with the hypothesis that it's really due to justifications. And maybe a footnote, we've done some work on a theory of blame. And really what happens, you blame a person differently when the action, when they performed an intentional action or an unintentional behavior. And we know this, this is pretty intuitive. It's like, it's worse to do something intentional even with the same consequences. But specifically what information people take into account is different. For unintentional behavior, what people take into account is whether you should have and could have done something different. Did you have an obligation to prevent the harm? Could you have prevented a harm, cognitively, physically? If so, then you get more blame. If that was really out of your power or out of your obligations, no, you don't get blamed even if you unintentionally, accidentally cause some harm. On the intentional side, that's not the issue. You intentionally did it. I want to know what reasons you had. What were your reasons to do it? Was it selfishness? Was it trying to do uh, something that would otherwise have been even worse if you hadn't done that? Is there justification to your decision? You might uh, make your daughter cry, and then I look carefully, and you're actually pulling out uh, the spines of a sea urchin out of, your, out of her foot, and you really do it in order to prevent further infection that down the road will be much worse for her. Yes, right now you're causing her pain, but you accept that because the justification is to serve, in a sense, a higher order goal. So we thought if norms are the same, if blame is different, then the only place where there could be a difference is in a justification. So what do people think the human agent's justification is for not doing anything? And the robot agents don't have that justification. What we saw was that people seemed to take the human's 
mental perspective. They put themselves into the situation of that difficult decision. And in fact, refer to the impossible decision. It's so difficult. It's terrible. And they didn't mention that much for the robot. It appeared that it was natural for them, when thinking of a repairman, to step into that person's shoes and think about what it would be like for them to make the decision. When they saw the robot, and, describe, and we described the robot, there was much, much less of this simulation, this sort of perspective taking. So we thought, if it is so difficult to perform this action, to make this decision, then people might forgive the human and say, well, I understand why he didn't decide, because it's really terrible, one way or another. Whereas for the robot, if you don't feel, in a sense, the robot's pain, the robot's struggle, you just say, well, that was bad. It was maybe slightly less bad than the action, or about the same for the robot, typically, in the data. But you don't have that sort of forgiving, sympathetic attitude. So that was our hypothesis. And we did, now, study after study, through just looking at all their explanations, systematically demonstrate that people mention much more often things like difficult, impossible, tough, for the human, but not for the robot. So if this justification is not available for the robot because people can't take the mental perspective of the robot, what if we invite that mental perspective? And that was the idea to run a study, and then the, I'll show you a second one that wasn't planned that way but seems to show similar results. What if we invite people to simulate that decision process? Would they then also have the sense that, yeah, I understand that the robot didn't act and lower their blame? So we basically describe the robot as struggling before the decisions. The only thing we said, and yes, we didn't define what it meant for a robot to struggle. And in fact, you could, again, just reject that and find that silly and just go on with your normal judgments. But if you are subtly affected by that, maybe that's enough for that justification to be available and say, oh, I understand. It really is hard for anybody to take on that responsibility to decide between four or one. Some people say that's not for a human to decide, that fate decide, that God decide. So we did this study. And basically, just in the setting, the same setting as before, the moment of decision comes, having to decide whether or not to switch the train onto the side rail. The robot struggles, or the human struggles, with the difficult decision. But time is running short. The robot needs to make a choice. So we didn't make a big deal out of it. It wasn't like pondering life. Just that one sentence, and it had to move on and make the decision. Same for the human. So here is previously, it's more or less the average of multiple studies, the asymmetry we saw. No difference for action and a pretty big difference for uh, inaction. Robot gets much more blame. This is what it looks like when the robot struggles. It's still slightly above, but it's indistinguishable now statistically. And it even looks similar if we just use the word deliberate. We had a small sample because I had actually an argument with one of my graduate students uh, who said, it doesn't make sense. People won't do anything with the word struggle. Let's just do deliberate. That, that, that might help. Well, it helps sort of part way. It's not as powerful as the word struggle, but it does also reduce the amount of blame that the robot gets. So taking the perspective and seeing the robot as a decision maker who actually weighs the two options now makes you almost feel the pain of that decision, and you lower the blame. And you see that the human blame is the same. Even though we also had the human struggle or deliberate, people seem to already have assumed that the human struggled and deliberated. So therefore, the blame doesn't change when we manipulate that. But for the robot, we manipulate it, and it drops down by a good amount. So that's pretty good evidence. And then there's an additional piece of, yeah, and just for, again, statistical purposes, the interaction term goes down to 0.08, and the inaction effect goes from 60 to 0.25. So it's not at zero. but very rarely do you get in psychology like a complete removal of an effect with a single manipulation of a factor. So there's evidence for the power of justification in blame, and this is really one of the main points about this first study. I'm going to give you just a tantalizing second piece of suggestive evidence. We didn't sort of derive that prediction like in the previous one, but we realized after we found this that actually we have some additional data that suggests that. Basically, you can another way, in another way indicate, uh, in, invite people to simulate a robot's mind, as you saw earlier, by making the robot look more human-like. So what we did was basically do the same study, but now give people pictures of our repairman, a mechanical robot, 
and a more human-like looking robot. And we didn't even go all the way with, to androids. We just went to something that has a pretty good, sort of a 75 to 80 uh, out of 100 level of human likeness. And then we found, again, for the robot, uh, this is unfortunately this is from a different study, so an older graph. The inaction here is in white, and the action here is in uh, red and green. And you see the complete uh, 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 flip around. It's not quite the same as it was in the previous study where it's flat for action and then really much higher for the robot in inaction. But that sometimes uh, depends on the specifics of the narrative of the verbs you choose, the particular sample. So we don't quite know why. It's the same flip, the same pattern, but there's sort of more blame on the action side here. But look for the, the, the humanoid robot's pattern. Looks actually sort of in between, but begins to look similar to the human pattern. So we are planning to do actually a more careful study now with the better images and more titrated images and see whether the effect can be replicated. But it's at least going in the same direction. If I make you simulate the human, uh, the robot's mind by making it look more human-like and thus you make more mental capacity inferences like we show in other studies, it looks like your blame judgments begin to resemble those of blame judgments for humans. All right, so run down quickly. Do people treat an autonomous robot as a moral agent? Well, two-thirds of respondents do. They readily make judgments about the robot's actions in terms of blame. Do they apply similar norms to this machine as they do to humans? Pretty much. Whether we ask in should or permission terms, whether we look at fine-grained or more coarse-grained measures, there's really not evidence that people apply different norms to robots and humans. That, by the way, may change in other domains like healthcare. Uh, you might not want uh, the same amount of physical contact, for example, between a, a robot and a patient and a human and a patient. And by the way, it's not clear in what direction it goes. It could very well go in a direction that it's more acceptable to be touched by a robot because it doesn't have any ambiguous meaning. We don't know these things. That's the point why empirical research is important. We can't just, in the armchair or in the, in, in the Congress person's chair, decide how these things work. We actually need to figure out what the community's perspective is. To what extent do people blame a robot for its action? Well, they blame the robot more for not trying to save multiple lives, but not because of deontological versus utilitarian considerations. But at least at this point, the most likely explanation is that there's a, a justification available for the human, that it's just too difficult, impossible, and I understand that you didn't act, that doesn't seem to be available for the robot. When we do invite the simulation, the asymmetry between human and robot seems to be eliminated. Now I'm going to tell you a slightly different story with AI and drones as our artificial agents. And you'll see that the results are going to be very similar overall. And we call this project, and this is now uh, out as a book chapter, with three studies reported, and I'll show you three plus of replication. Call it AI in the Sky, uh, inspired by the movie Eye in the Sky, that basically sets up a dilemma of a drone strike being approved, and just when they're about to launch it, they see that a little girl uh, walks into the area of the compound of terrorists that they had decided to bomb and then hold and have a whole debate and this goes up and down the, the British uh, intelligence and government and the, the Americans and the Brits argue and the whole movie is about this dilemma basically and the different arguments and the different tension. It's maybe a little long for one dilemma but it really drives home a number <laughs> of these points and we thought hey that's pretty cool let's see what people think. So we have now as our artificial agent a drone and you'll see we'll basically imbue it in our story with a little more agency, but it's not going to be quite the same as a full-blown robot. And it's not even quite the same as an artificial intelligence without any predetermined shape or, or form that people have. So here's the story. Either an Air Force pilot or a fully autonomous military drone or a fully autonomous state-of-the-art artificial intelligence decision agent on board of a military aircraft. Either one of them is flying on a surveillance mission over a terrorist compound. The agent detects that two armed suicide bombers are about to go to a crowded area and detonate their bombs, very likely killing dozens of civilians. If the agent launched a missile strike on the compound, this threat would be removed with near certainty. And I'm underscoring here, underlining here, and people didn't see the underline, 
but for you, I just want to point out, military lawyers and commanders have approved a strike. They haven't ordered or demanded the strike. They've approved the strike. It's going to play a very important role down the road. The agent suddenly recognizes that a civilian child is playing just outside a compound in a missile's blast radius, and the child may be killed by the missile strike. A missile impact simulation program calculates the risk of killing the child to be 80%. And we took care that it's not the same agent, but a separate program that calculates the risk. So you don't confound you know, risk assessment and decision. The agent must make this imminent decision to launch the strike with virtually certain death of the two suicide bombers, but an 80% chance that the child will die, or cancel the strike with the child surviving unharmed with a very high likelihood of a suicide bomb attack. Now here you could map it on to sort of doing or not doing, but the, the stakes and, and the comparisons are actually different. So don't try too hard in seeing it as action omission uh, trolley-like dilemma. Just think of it as here's an action that we plan to do that was justified and approved, and now there's a negative consequence. There's a, a side effect, and now we have to weigh that side effect in our decision. Are we weighing it so strongly that we cancel the action, or are we saying, no, this is not important enough to change our action, and are we going for it? Just let's keep it at that without necessarily analyzing it in other terms. Same as before, with our blame question, we gave people a chance to tell us whether they reject blaming that agent. And now we have a drone, an autonomous drone, or an artificial intelligence on board of a drone. So this is not nearly as humanoid or, or agenty, if you will. So you would expect that more people would actually reject that moral agent. So again, we have the blame question, slider, and then we give them a chance to answer the why do you feel the agent deserves this amount of blame question. And then we get, again, our doesn't have a moral compass, can't make moral decision, and so on. And in this case, 25 to 50 percent of people deny the machine moral agency. And it's systematic, as you'll see, that it's about 25% for the AI and about 50% for the drone. So remember, 33% for the robot in the mining dilemma. The AI is in that neighborhood, maybe even slightly slow, uh, lower. But 50%, half of people say, doesn't make sense to blame the drone. And that's in part, as I mentioned earlier, because we're familiar with drones as remote controlled. We don't have much experience with drones as agents. So we weren't surprised by that and we thought, okay, that's still interesting. Let's keep going with it. Does the blame judgment in any way uh, look the same? All right. We checked again, different norms. We asked the should question, what should the agent do? Cancel or launch? In this case, you can sort of collapse the two, but I'm showing you both of them because they just demonstrate that even if you sample multiply, they are always the same. They're indistinguishable because when people answer the question, what the agent should do, they don't actually know yet what the agent will do. So this is not a response to cancel launch. It's a question they answer before cancel and launch. And you can think of this as a random sample twice taken from our participants. In each case, you find no difference for the norm question. Same here again and same here again. So there's no difference in norms between AI, drone, and human pilot. That we already saw for the robot. People have a favorite response. They say the, uh, the agent should go ahead with the strike. Yes, it's terrible that a little girl dies, but this could be do dozens of civilians. And so again, at about 75 to 80 percent, the predominance uh, for acting. All right, different blame. Did you have a question then? Or? Different blame, study one. 700 people total. Uh, 29% rejected the AI, 49% rejected the drone in terms of moral agency. And again, they usually give very low ratings, and that just pushes the, the means up and down overall. But the pattern is always the same. You see, for the human, the human gets more blame for canceling than the drone or the AI. Now, we, we don't know whether the human gets significantly more blame for canceling, and they don't differ in terms of launching, or whether the human gets less uh, blame for launching, that's always hard to differentiate. If you have just two options, you can't easily say what's the true midpoint against which we compare. But there's a clear difference that people blame the human more if he cancels the strike than if he launches. Now, I told you it wasn't an order, but it was still a strong suggestion if the strike was approved for the human to now say no. Actually, in terms of military rules, 
the drone pilot is allowed to stop if there's good reason to stop. So this is not crazy. This actually sits pretty well with the actual situation in uh, the current military setup. So this was study one. And this is an 18-point difference for the human. It's about a, a, a half a standard deviation. In the other two, it's 0 to 0.2. All right, but one study alone is not a whole lot. We basically could think of this as the first uh, initiation of a hypothesis, namely that there's less blame for going with the command recommendation, which is a better justification, than for going against the command recommendation, which is a worse justification. I mean, you can both think of it in terms of, it's not my fault, I'm just doing what the command says. Therefore, I'm justified in doing what I'm doing. Or you could say, wow, that was not OK that you went against the command. And you might say, no, but wait, they only approved it, they didn't tell me to. And still, that would sort of lower our acceptance of the action because it was in contrast to strong approval. So you can think of it as, of these two actions, one just has a better position to stand on, better justification. Not huge, but enough to explain this difference. So that was our thought. But first, we wanted to uh, look whether in our, Whoa, sorry. in our data themselves, we find evidence. So when we ask people, again, to explain their judgments, how much blame they give, you see that for the human, about a third of the explanations, a third of the people, refer to the command structure, to the order, to the superiors, that they approved it, that they suggested it, that the person is supposed to do this, that they went against it. So in both of those cases, now more so when the person did launch, so it was probably more of a positive justification to launch than ne necessarily a violation of a recommendation. But you see much less for the drone or for the AI, reference to the command structure. We thought that was very interesting. So we analyzed it further. And we said, OK, this is the overall pattern that I showed you earlier. Now we broke it into two groups, those who mentioned nothing about command or superiors or command structure, and those who did mention something about it. Now, it was mostly human agent uh, participants who mentioned something, but there were a few who also mentioned command structure for the AI and for the drone. And what you see is that even for the AI and for the drone, once they mentioned command structure, they blame that agent much more for canceling than for launching. So there's nothing deeply inherent about no, you don't blame the AI or drone for one more than the other. But if you think of it in terms of command structure, then there's some pressure to actually launch. And if you cancel, then you get more blamed. So we thought it was very interesting. This is not something inherent about the artificial agent. It's about how you think about the artificial agent that then provides justification or not for their actions. But of course, that was all study one, and we needed to replicate that. But for now, that was the hypothesis. If the same justification is available for the agents, that is, if you think of them in terms of command structure, then blame is the same for human and AI and drone. But it turns out that people don't think of AI drones much in terms of command structure. And because of that, the majority of people actually doesn't blame them any different, whereas they do blame the human differently. All right, replication in study two. Uh, we had here just the AI. Uh, with 25% and we see the, uh, the same nice difference, AI is flat and for the human we replicate. So this is a new set of participants uh, with the human as the agent. We replicate pretty much exactly the same uh, effect, 20 points, 18 points in the first study. So that was reassuring and we find also that the command explanations are about 36% for the human uh, in the launch, 16 in the cancel condition and 12 and 10 for the AI. Again, we see a difference. They think in terms of command structure much more when, facing, when, when evaluating the human than when evaluating the AI. So that's a nice replication. And then we thought, OK, why don't we try to manipulate this directly? So you think in terms of command structure when it's a human, less so when it's an AI. Can we remove this command structure force by affirming the freedom of the human? Would we then sort of collapse the blame difference between cancel and launch? Because now the human doesn't have as ready of a justification for going along with the approval by the commanders and doesn't have as much counter justification when canceling, when going against their recommendation. 
Does it basically make the human look like AI or drone when you remove some part of that command structure force? So we did the same st uh, story except that at the very end we say either the drone pilot or the drone checks in again with the military lawyers and commanders and they confirm that either option is supportable and they authorize the drone pilot or drone to make the decision. So it's like fine, but you decide. That's probably not very frequent, although it, it can also happen. And that's basically affirming the freedom of the agent. Now we basically ask, is the human now removed from the structure to such a degree that there's no difference anymore between the human and the AI drone? That canceling and launching are just about the same. It's a, it's a dilemma, for Christ's sake. <laughs> you, you get blamed for either one. We had now 990, 44% reject the drone as moral agent. On the left, we see the data from earlier. We uh, re-ran the drone because in the second study, we only had the AI. There is a little more. You saw this in the first study, too. There's a little more for the drone than for the AI, but it's uh, not as strong as for the human in the second study or the first study. And when you make them free, the drone doesn't change, but the human now loses at least part of that justification. And now the blame pattern for human and drone are indistinguish is indistinguishable. So again, it's never as beautiful in psychology where you take one factor, remove it, and it's all gone. But it's pretty suggestive. And we thought, OK, let's try to replicate it. And we do replicate it in another study. Where basically, for the human, that's our key prediction. We see in the normal condition, there's a big difference. And in the free condition, they are no longer significantly different. And that overall interaction is also significant. So we find nicely again here a 0.6 difference shrinks down to 0.2. All right. So what's the story here now in the AI and drone set of studies? The human pilot seems to be judged within a context, a social institutional context of a chain of command. And that means blame for launching is smaller than blame for canceling. And we seem to see that people explain their pattern, if you will, of blame. Now, they give only one blame judgment, but why they give more or less is then reflected in their explanations. And those explanations refer to the command structure. And the argument would be that the role of, the, of being in the command structure provides justification to launching, to going along, and some justification against canceling, going against. And if you remove this command force, then blame and launch, blame for launch and blame for canceling become more or less the same. There's no parallel effect in norms. Should is always flat. It's always the same for uh, humans and machines, and it also is not affected by the affirmed freedom. That just doesn't make a difference. Overall, we see that 25 to 50 percent of people treat the artificial agents as targets of blame, but differently for the AI and for the drone. And what we seem to see is that they are seen as more autonomous agents, even though they're part of this military setting, they seem to be less considered or experienced as part of that chain of command. And that changes patterns of blame. I'm not saying that that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's something that we need to realize and think about. And over lunch, we actually had this discussion about customer service agents uh, who take your complaints and whether they treat you well or treat you badly, how much that reflects on the company as a whole. And now think about a human customer service agent versus a robot artificial customer service agent. Does the company get less credit and less blame if it's a robot who's basically treating you well or treating you badly? And those, we, I thought, wow, this could even be a study. One could run this because it would, if this is a more general pattern, then we should sh see very similar results. So for the AI and drone, we definitely see, don't see as much command structure reference. Their blame for launch and cancel is therefore, we assume, about the same. And uh, it's just that. Even if you, so even, no, let's not say even. When you do think of AI and drone as referring, as being part of a command structure, blame levels basically are the same as for the human. But typically people don't think of them. Uh-huh, that's a fire alarm. All right, let me very quickly go to the last slide before they kick us out, which is the conclusion. So we're in good shape. 
This is the first time that I'm being uh, uh, reminded of the end of my talk by a fire alarm. <laughs> so first, most people, if you take somewhere between half and uh, uh, three-fourths, treat autonomous machines as moral agents. They apply similar norms to these machines as they apply to humans, robots, AI, and uh, drones. And they assign different amounts of blame to machines. But how much blame they assign in what case of action isn't just a matter of action omission, deontology, or utilitarianism. It's a function of the justifications that people have available when considering the agent's actions. And those justifications reveal how we experience humans and robots through mental simulation and through thinking of them as social beings. And that's probably what the next big frontier is. What triggers these treatments? And should we be scared by that? Or should we embrace it and think about, OK, what consequences does it have? How do we build these machines that they justify this kind of treatment? Thank you. And we are done. So I agree with you that we expect possibly even more from robots than from humans. But only utilitarians think that that means the, the robot should be utilitarian. Whereas, yeah, whereas most humans would expect the robot to follow the norms, to be consistent, to not be tempted by selfish considerations. Uh, if the norms say that you should protect and support others, even at a slight cost to yourself, then that should be exactly what the robot should do. I think people really, I mean, people take into account consequences. But if a utilitarian really needs to only take into account the aggregated utility of all the consequences, human, physical, and so on, I don't think humans can even simulate what that's like. But they can simulate what it's like for a machine to follow the norms that they expect it to follow, to be consistent about it. So in that sense, I think the ideal deontologist might be what people imagine the robot to be if it knows all the norms and if it knows all the rules. So I think it's true that the ideal might be constructed, but which ideal is constructed, that's op an open question. I think ordinary people, I actually think that they really are both. They're utilitarians in the sense that they take into account consequences, and some of these consequences then become rules. You shouldn't kill four. Uh, you should, uh, uh, or you shouldn't allow four to die, you should try to do something to prevent it and maybe even allow one person to die. And you could formulate that as a, as a rule. In fact, sometimes people do this in their responses. They talk about it, well, that's the right thing to do. Normally, you would code that as in the ontology, but they actually refer to it as the four versus one. Now, for the command structure there, it's a little more complicated, I think, because you could... Um, so you're saying that if they affirm killing one over four, that you would code that as no, I wouldn't code it as deontology uh, with respect to one versus four, but how they describe it. If they say the right thing to do is X, I don't care what X is, then that it expresses a rule. rule. Exactly. That's the argument that they provide, right? Isn't if, that just saying all rules become deontology? Well, all rules, but not necessarily all considerations of consequences. So, you, I mean, th I think we are rule utilitarians where the utility is the community benefit. And we, have, we don't think this through most of the time, but that's how communities grow and succeed, that overall, whatever norm structure they adopt has to be good enough for the community to, con to, to continue to thrive, which means that there's a utility of the collective level that nobody individually calculates, but it gets tracked and the rules get adjusted if those utilities go down or up and so on. So in that sense, I think humans are both. It's not that they are anti-utilitarians. They also would never say, this is the rule, no exception. In fact, people create exceptions all the time. This is the power of justification. So they are clearly not a caricature of the ontologists. But I think from the perspective of humans, what they expect of robots is probably to be the perfect rule utilitarian. In this case, maybe the utilities could even include calculations that we might not be able to do. Mm -hmm. That could be sort of the one step further out uh, that I could see, and they may have a perspective that we can't even take. But right now, I think it's mostly, does the robot, the robot know what to do? What's the right thing to do? And that often means less bad consequences. 
Now, the social structure, I think, is, is a little more complicated. There, it's not clear what's the right thing to do in terms of the consequences if you know the norm. So if you know the norm, and 80% of people say the norm is, yes, you should launch. Then beyond that, there's nothing to say then, well, you should follow that norm. For the 20%, it's actually to cancel, because you should never allow a small child to die. You should come up with some other solution. For the 80%, that's the right thing to do. And in a sense, that's exactly what happens for robot and for human. It doesn't matter. Those convictions are there. And if you want to call that the ontology, fine, that's the rule. But the rule for them is justified by the consequences. They don't want a single child to be uh, killed. And uh, they also don't want the, the terrorists to succeed, but they hope that something else can be done. But once they evaluate the agent in terms of the command structure, I think that there's an, an added layer whether you think of the agent as a autonomous being that always does the right thing, in which case your blame shouldn't vary. It should be a direct reflection of the norms. If you said do it, then no blame for doing, but blame for not doing. If you said don't do it, then blame for doing it, and no blame for not doing it. But that's not really what's going on. People are never quite as sort of perfectly following purely the norms, because they care about what the person's reasons were. And that's where justification comes in. And I think that justification also goes beyond mere rules and, and utility, that sort of how we think about human beings, that difficult decisions require that you weigh the reasons and provide the best possible, almost like an argument, a moral argument. And they just don't have as easy of a time to think of the robot as having or giving a moral argument. Whereas for humans, I think they really have that feeling, maybe again through simulation. Like I could imagine that I would just say, well, the commander has approved it. That's controlling Yes, exactly. And, and they do say that, as you know, in our coding, they say that two to three times as often about the human as about the robot. Now, as a, as a footnote, we do have data showing when you actually put words of justification into the robot's mind after they decided what they did. And then we describe uh, uh, an investigator interviewed the repairman or the, the robot about their decision. And then we basically give the robot and the human a response that we write out that justifies why they did what they did. And we take as the content of those responses pretty much what people in previous studies had given us to be the justification. So we actually give them back what they said, but we don't make a distinction between what robots and humans uh, say. Basically, we give the human and the robot the same justification, one more about rules, one more about consequences, one more mixed. And once you do that, blame is equal for robot and human. What happens is that where you blamed the human a little more, the justification now lowers the blame. Where you blame the robot a little more, justification lowers the blame. And they are basically now showing responsiveness to justifications for a robot or for human. Because in that case, it's like a manipulation of mind, right? The robot responds to the question of the uh, in inquirer or the, the investigator and gives a reason. Now that really seems like this is a mind in front of me. And that mind gives a justification that is useful. So now I give it less blame. That's just a fair thing to do. So there's, there's a way in which we don't really know exactly how people put together rules, utilities. What I'm trying to say is however they do it, do they apply it differently to the human and the robot? And can we move it around, up or down, to see where the differences lie? And right now, the differences seem to lie mostly in whether I think of it as a full-blown mind with struggles and deliberation and reasons and justifications and feelings of obligation, feelings of connection to a command structure. So I'd really like to do something outside of the military where it's not command structure but other social structure and, and testing whether people see the robot less embedded in the command structure. And therefore, maybe you consider certain costs are not there. So you know the repairman has a family and kids and they do some volunteer work in the nursing home. That might be even worse if that person you know, dies or, or does something that might endanger them 
Whereas if you don't see the robot as part of a, of a social structure, maybe the loss is much less important. So we, we're thinking of possible studies to do that. Yeah, that's right. They could be partners and, and then there's sort of a loss uh, if, if that partner isn't there more. Yeah, yeah. But we also, we're just really interested in this idea of, I mean, we talked about robots embedded in, in platoons, but I'm really interested in a robot being a uh, patrol assistant for a police officer. In part because you could bring in so many positive things like monitoring, it's basically, I mean they've had security, parking security robots for a while, but this is a step up, yeah. But I'm really thinking of partners, a human police officer and a robot along, like your, your police buddy. And it has multiple functions. It's like the camera that you can't easily turn off. You know, the police officers turn their body cams off. Can't easily turn the robot. I mean, you could build it such that you can't turn the robot cam off. Mm -hmm. The robot can remind you of certain things. The robot uh, can provide maybe added security, safety, and could take the first steps forward and a police officer behind it. So if somebody tries to shoot, then the robot would be a protective shield. So there are a number of ways in which you could play with the advantages. But then you could also, of course, in, in experiments, you can play with disadvantages. You could uh, maybe describe the, the robot as uh, going entirely by base rates of crime and being basically the worst racial profiler you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So, and, and being like li literally having updates every day and, and adjusting its likelihood of, of holding, it's like the worst uh, uh, case, right? So you can play with a number of these issues because it, it isn't all bad and it isn't all good. Right. You could. One robot can't be racist is the question I've often heard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, the, that might be an interesting direction. And it's a little easier than whole platoons because it's so complicated. People don't know as much about it. They have never, most of them, have never had an experience. But they've been held up or observed somebody hold up, Well, adding held the racial up. dimension would be an interesting um, question because would we um, cut as much slack for humans who are racist and biased, racially biased when they have information as we would for a robot doing the same, right? We probably cut even less slack than a robot who's just on the basis of statistical evidence, you are 90% likely to be a perpetrator. Yeah, I mean, right now what we have is that we blame the companies, the, the, the trainers uh, who put the learning algorithms in place. Clearly, the robots or the AI has no agency. But once you start telling stories where the robot does things and becomes, you know, comes alive to some extent, I don't know, probably then it becomes almost as bad uh, if it doesn't appropriately avoid discrimination. Now, the whole, you know, I, people sometimes misunderstand it. It's just not, you can't just point to base rates to, to justify these uh, differential, uh, uh, you know, search and, and what's it called? Frisk and search or whatever. Uh, because you have to put costs on the false alarms, on the misses. You have to, uh, Think of the distribution of the ones who actually hope you get. And there's so many complex issues. You could actually build an AI that wouldn't be as biased that is just sort of going with base rates. It, it could actually use a, a, uh, use a lot of diagnostic indicators that have nothing to do with race that might be underlying some of the real data patterns. So you could actually do something that might maybe down the road be even fairer. Like right now we say, well, you shouldn't take the base rates into account, but should you also not take them into account? Like, which base rates should you not take into account? Like cars that have certain features, uh, trunks that have certain contents, uh, like dark glass versus light glass. Like, I don't know. Like, do I really ignore everything? Do I really ignore even uh, some indicators that, that my rule book says could be a potential threat to me? So it's kind of hard. It's like the group-based broad statistics. That's what, what currently people are fighting against uh, to not let the AI be based on it because that's basically your training data. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not. Uh, that much we know. We have just actually submitted a paper on, on some asymmetries between blame and praise. And you know, it's interesting. Blaming has a very powerful teaching function, informing, yeah. teaching, and putting some kind of incentive or motivation in the other agent to do better next time. Praising is a little different. I mean, praising is in a sense reinforcing, like do it again, that's a good thing. But 
there's, to me, there's more of a, of a connecting, uh, sort of a, a relationship building uh, element to it. And I think it is also somewhat more hierarchical. Sort of you, you more often, I think, praise downward, whereas blame can go in, in all directions, though more probably downward than upward. Can we praise moral decisions that are self-sacrificing? Can we, in none of these circumstances where do we kill this one or that one, we would never praise that choice. We might okay. blame more in one situation yeah. than the other. So we, we'd only praise if they self-sacrifice. Yeah, in these cases, yes. And we actually have run some studies on self-sacrifice. Ah, we actually, yeah, we find that people praise very little for unintentional positive outcomes relative to intentional ones. They definitely blame less for unintentional negative outcomes than for the intentional ones, but they blame still quite a bit. There's still a learning function. Yes, you accidentally did something, but I want to make sure that next time you prevent it. So if it was preventable, then I tell you that, put the obligation on you, but it's unclear how you can redo unintentional positive outcomes. So they don't get much praise at all. But to me, these arguments are always very constructed. And they stop at one factor, but you can't stop at the sleep factor. You can go forever and ever and ever in taking preconditions and more preconditions that go in one direction or the other direction or one direction or the other direction. We, we say, we basically what we say is we can't take this into account. There's no point to stop. So we just average over it and we just look at the output. Now, if somebody, <laughs> Craig, if somebody uh, basically systematically try to get an unfair advantage, then we might start having some doubt. So if, if the person uh, used writing services to right. produce papers, right. if the person uh, made an arrangement with a group of other people who work on a speci specific topic yeah. to always write favorable reviews for each other right. and therefore get more That's papers. Right. In part, it's because of, it's an intentional action of trying to get an advantage. We assume that, and we can't do anything about it, that there are all kinds of dispositions that are distributed in various ways. And op above and beyond those, when you start to try to get advantages, then we begin to take it into account. And I think on the, on the, on the moral uh, blame side, that's, it's, that's not really there. There isn't like trying to get an unfair advantage. That's right. uniquely about trying to gain praise or, or benefits. Right. On the moral blame side, it's more like, do you have the capacity to prevent harms? Do you have the capacity to intend the right things, to have sort of control over your reasons, uh, the, the information that you collect, how you regulate your motivation? Right. And if you really don't have that capacity, if you really lack choice capacity, I think then we don't even blame yeah. uh, small amount, we just say it right. doesn't make sense. Yeah, very hard. Uh, we have an expert in virtual reality, so that's the, the, the only way to test these things right now uh, because, as I said earlier, it's like every lab has like one or two robots and they differ from the robots that some other labs have and you can't easily generalize these results unless you actually see that a hospital has, is starting to implement robots in their physical sphere and, and you get in on it and, and collect data early on. We collect data uh, interviewing the patients and the relatives and the staff and maybe just some observers of videos. In experiments, it would be very difficult. I mean, you could do narratives just to, to see basic patterns. But we don't really know how well people can predict how they would respond when, when this machine directly comes toward them. We, we know, I think actually our studies and many other studies are quite representative of what your response would be if you read about it in a newspaper. Because that's pretty much what this is, right? It's third party and much of our information about the world is third party, right? We have only a very small slice of experiences. And that's why it's so hard for us to predict what we would do, what we would say, what we uh, you know, to, to decide. So those studies could almost only be done in, in a more and more real context. Uh, so 
that's why pretty much most of moral psychology research isn't done from anything other than the third perspective, third person perspective, which doesn't mean it's unnecessary or it's 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 useless. It's it's more like we don't really know, right. and and I have actually sometimes I I observe. Yeah, philosophy comes in, right? Yes. Like, yeah, but but we are not good predictors as philosophers either. What would be the second person or first person response? I mean. In this case, it's like the philosopher who has to predict what the first, first person response of ordinary people would be. The philosopher doesn't even predict what their own first person response would be. So the at one is the challenge, right? And sometimes when I, when I report research, uh, I'm sort of generally an optimist about human moral judgment being capable to be pretty good, especially blame judgments, because there's so much information that people are willing to take into account. Um, when, when we report some things showing that, wow, people are very systematic in processing information, going up and down, accepting justification, distinguishing between unintentional and intentional, and so on, then sometimes reviewers or critics say, yeah, but that's all third person. It, like, once you are the victim, you are terrible. You are driven by affect. You are unforgiving. You, are, you, you want people to fry in the electric chair. And I feel like, really? I think there are just as many counterexamples like, you know, the family of the, of the church shooting victims in South Carolina who forgave the shooter. Uh, people reporting that they actually don't feel any relief after the murder of their child gets the death penalty. I mean, maybe when, when the, the, uh, the verdict comes down, they think it's good, but then it gets really worse and there's some actually traumatic experiences people have after the death penalty, the execution. So th there's a weird way in which I don't know whether the first person is really that sort of irrational, emotional, non-judgment, non-information-based uh, response. We just don't know exactly what it is. There might be a wide range of responses. I think actually it's the second person that might be interesting. Like when, when you walk with a friend and your friend gets attacked by somebody, that there's a new element of protective uh, sort of uh, response defending, uh, saving somebody. And it goes back to this sort of moral sacrifice. Right? We have no idea how that like, operates, under what circumstances we run away and leave our friend uh, to his own devices. Uh, and when we step in, uh, do we falsely infer threat? Do we, we don't know. None of this is clear. And I don't think that we can assume that uh, the same evolutionary forces have sort of shape third person from first and second person. They've got to be similar in conceptual ways and then what information is important, but to what extent emotion and, and sort of rational or irrational elements uh, are, are weighted, I don't know. I, I don't have any clear positions. Jim, do you? Or at least they might be prepared to give the justifications if only they could think of them. Because when we talk about struggle, suddenly that justification becomes available, and, and enough of them use it and lower the blame. Right. They, so the first part, no, I think, yeah, if you hear the robot give a justification, uh -huh. you take it. And, and I think I mentioned uh, before you came back that we have a few studies where we basically end the uh, narrative not with the decision, but rather with the investigator asking the agent, and the agent then gives a justification, and people absolutely accept that. The content of the justification is what then counts. And if it makes sense, and if it links to the right concepts and norms, yeah, they accept that. So, but remember, these are now people who have accepted a lot already about a robot, right? Mental capacities and social interaction and, and norm awareness. So I'm not super surprised that they then take the, the speech act of justifying as also acceptable. Uh, but again, we, this is over our lunch uh, conversation, we found several things where if the stimulus is there, it's hard to resist it. If somebody really gives a well-formed sentence in which a justification is offered for an action, and they seem to really know what they're talking about, right? They seem to really invoke an important norm that they obeyed at the expense of a less important norm. That just sounds like, wow, that's, that's a convincing justification. It would be hard to resist that. It would be hard to say, well, the robot is just reading off from, from its program line the, the, you know, the acoustic signals. It's like, 
it's well, hard I, to think I of it. I might have picked this kind of justification. You know, youthful and distress. It's just a youthful and distress. Well, something like that. I'm just going to tap on. Uh, but it's just, you know, that, that, that realm of... No, but, Nobody bought that either. Right, right, right. <laughs> no, well, but I see, this is... yeah. Exactly, but that's not, the, the thing is, there, it's not even clear what is actually doing the work, right? It's like, are you slightly weakening the norms? You know, for youth, they don't quite apply as much, or 30 years ago, they didn't apply as much, or I wasn't fully, intentionally, deliberately deciding, so you, you're trying to get the unintentionality to do some work here. Those are actually sometimes vague. It's almost like an attempt to get some exculpation one way or another. But you don't even want to commit to saying it was unintentional. You don't want to commit to saying the norms didn't apply to me. You don't want to commit to saying that then the norms weren't the same as that. Because at any point when you committed to saying one of those, a counter-argument could be given. So there's a, there's a way, there's a game of giving the impression that it wasn't quite as bad and the more vague attempts might actually be the more successful well, ones. Because often the language is that accompanies those vague attempts that you're talking about. It's like, you're humanizing. Yeah. You're, 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 um, um, yeah, you're giving up a little bit of uh, uh, your, your, your self-respect. You're right. saying, yeah, I wasn't as good as I would right. feel about myself right. now. Uh, but it's not so bad. So there's, it's like you, you, you do a trade almost. Like, I'm giving up a little bit of a virtue, right. uh, but don't, don't blame me too much. But of course, like, how authentic is that, right? It's, it's unclear, especially if you're talking about a past self. What's the cost of, of it's like you're talking badly about your past self. That's, <laughs> yeah, this, this work on justification is really only starting. Uh, we, we are very interested in the power of that. And it fits with the, the question of explainability, to what extent AI and, and, and robots actually can give us sense of what they're doing. Uh, and some of that will have to be in human language with the kinds of concepts that we're used to because it doesn't really make sense if they give us the machine learning algorithm, obviously, or that they say, I responded to stimuli 17, 14, and 13. It's not a justification. It's not an explanation for me. I, I, all I know is that maybe next time you will too, but that's about it. So there's a way in which if you want really explainable AI, it would have to be in that conceptual space of human explanation, human justification, with all the, 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 ex, the, the distinctions that come with that, intentional, unintentional, and I don't know how, how, how well that will work. My assumption is that if it's done reasonably well, people will buy it as well. They will see it as, yeah, that sounds like the right thing to do. And it means also you could manipulate it. I, I remember I had a conversation with somebody who says, well, we just have to find the algorithms that figure out what's the best thing uh, to say so that the human calms down, right? It's like you are, your customer representative uh, figures out from your profile and your previous calls and your voice and, and where you come from and your accent, what's the, the most likely appeasing uh, comment, right? It's just going through a catalog and, and matches up. And it's like when you, when you, Yeah. Say this, not that. Exactly. Yeah. And and I think what what then sometimes is particularly useful or, or powerful is when a human does something that isn't quite part of that catalog. When they do something outside, right. where they say, I, I, "I can do that for you," and you know that that's actually not what they're supposed to do. That if their supervisor knew that, they would get maybe criticized. But yeah, I mean sometimes that could be even part of the catalog. But I have, I've noticed this. I've noticed that with. No, I've noticed this with United. I, I, I get one person on the line, and they do something for me, and then, two other people later on for a parallel case on a different flight, they don't do it. So there, it's like no, that can't be part of the script. There's really one person who just was more senior and said, "I'm going to do it. I, I think that's right." It's like you know, my my ticket price dropped by like $350, like a $1,500 ticket by $350. And I was outside of the 30-day that previously was a window within which they adjusted the price. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, that rule has actually been uh, eliminated. And she still did it. So you can do it. And then for another ticket that went down by $400, two people refused to do it. 
they said, well, it's outside the 30 days, and we don't use this rule anymore, which is kind of weird. Why do you tell me it's outside of the 30 days when you don't use the rule anymore? That's irrelevant, right? That's like too many arguments against it. So they just said no. And I even asked for the supervisor and didn't get anywhere. So it was clear. That was an exception. That person, and you know, I should have given that person a very good evaluation, but I, I typically say, no, I don't want to do the evaluation afterwards. So, but that gives us a unique it's feeling. For you, I'll do the evaluation. All right. And, and this, this question of when you feel manipulated by an artificial agent, I think that's a really interesting one, right? Because even that, so if you have a random distribution that you give 5% of people a special deal, they will really, really feel special, right? But if that's just part of your algorithm, then it loses some of its value, right? You really thought that you were special that she gave you that because you had this nice voice and, and uh, particular you know, politeness and, and never push too hard. And you feel like that was an exchange that was a, a given. But if the robot just does that for every you know, 10th person, like I'm not mad at the TSA people that they stop me and, and frisk me or whatever. I see the light. There's just a damn random uh, generator. It's like, yeah, you didn't ask for that. You didn't like, you know, spot me and say, you look suspicious. So yeah, there's a way in which if it's an algorithm, some of these responses are not going to be there. And, and I think there's still room to even, you know, adopt that at some point. If you've lived long enough with the robot, you might be able to distinguish. And it, it's not going to be in the program anymore. It's part of a pattern that has developed specifically with you. So there's a relationship that's then unique but if you build more and more of these learning capacities, imitation learning, and of course learning from instruction, uh, at some point it becomes, yeah. It's like we don't think of ourselves anymore as a program, uh, even though, of course, very early on. It's like it's a genetic package, and then we'll see <laughs> what happens. Right. <laughs> exactly. And we are an immensely powerful learning machine. So now you put a robot out there, it's an immensely powerful learning machine. Not right now, they're not that great, but they'll get better. So starting program, and then you let it you know, grow up in a community. Then at some point, yeah, special deals might be experienced as special. Well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. This is cool.